I'm here to make you into saviors of men. Hallelujah. Sit down. Now, I want to read to you a vision of William Booth, who was this famous. When you come to London, you can go and look at his statue there. I want to read to you a vision that he had. And I, the main thing is the last thing that Jesus told him before the vision ended. Are you interested? Yes. All right. Now, he says, I had a very curious vision of heaven the other day. And I have been perplexed as to whether I should tell it to my friends or not. You get it? And um, in my vision, I saw that uh, I had a home, I had friends, I had all that was necessary for happiness. I was a Christian. Most of my intimate friends were the same. We visited each other's houses and were interested in each other's amusements, business engagements, political opinions, and many other things in his vision. Then he said, we bought and sold and married and gave in marriage. In short, we acted as though the world was going to last forever. I thought also I took some active part in the church I belonged. And in the vision, I held a prominent position to the financial management and occupied myself zealously in teaching Bible truths to the children. In fact, he said, I considered myself a shining light in the church. <laughs> in all this, I was quite sincere. And I had no notion of playing the hypocrite. In other words, I never thought that I was a hypocrite. It is true I did not stop to think what Christianity really was. Although I talk about it freely and pitied people who did not profess it. But I seldom considered the claims of Jesus Christ and the poor, sinning, suffering world about me. Although occasionally I heard people discussing it. But I never meditated on the sinful world that was all around me. In my vision, without warning, a dangerous fever seized me. And I went down unexpectedly. And before I knew where I was in this vision, the doctor pronounced me to be in a dangerous situation, condition. In fact, in a few hours, I was brought to the verge of death. Everyone around me was in greatest confusion while many of those who loved me were paralyzed with despair. Then following consultations with other medical doctors hurrying from far, many suggestions as to the possible remedies to heal me were made together with suggestions of how to get money and all that proved in vain. For my own part, I did not feel any particular alarm. Whether it was the suddenness of the visitation or the nature of the disease or the drugs they had given me, I cannot tell. But I seem to be the least disturbed person in the sickness. <laughs> hey, are you listening? I felt as though I was in a dream. I knew I was ill, dangerously ill. For a relative insisted that I should be informed 
of my real condition. Yet I was not distressed by the announcement. I thought I would recover. And I thought, even if I don't recover, what do I have to worry myself for? Was I not a Christian? Has Christ not died for me? Have I not been converted? Did I not believe in the Bible? What have I to fear? Then again, was I not always hearing hymns being sung for my comfort and prayers being prayed for my restoration? Huh? That even if recovery could not be granted to me, it was as earnestly as that I might pass away without suffering and have, have a happy admission into heaven. Why should I be disturbed? Or you don't understand the question. Now, even if disquieting thoughts did cross my mind, I could not help questions arising as to whether I had done my duty to a perishing world with my time, influence, money, and family. So it seemed as though it were impossible to do anything different under the circumstance than to just allow things to be. How could I otherwise do otherwise with a burning fever and my brain all confused? All right. Then I readily acceded to a suggestion made by my minister. And I felt moreover that if I was not ready for the change, I had neither the thought nor the energy to begin so a serious business over again as the salvation of my soul. In other words, he was so sick that he couldn't even be thinking of his salvation. All right. Besides, how could I make a confession in the presence of my wife and children and church comrades that I had been mistaken all these years and that my life had been a failure? No, it was too late and I was too ill for such any such action. He said, I'm a poor sinner and nothing at all. He says, it was with this very sentence on my lips, a sentence taken up and reproduced at the memorial service held the following Sunday, that a cold numbness came creeping over me, and then a great difficulty in breathing happened to me. My friends were alarmed, and I could see the apprehension on their faces. Some fell on their knees and broke out in prayer, while others wept. And my dear ones moistened my lips and kissed my brow and spoke their last and lingering farewells to me on my bed. This is a vision. Meanwhile, a strange faintness seized me, destroying my consciousness. My next sensation was altogether beyond description. It was a thrill of a new and celestial existence. Yeah. I was in heaven. Wow. <laughs> Are you interested in this vision? Now, after the first feeling of surprise occasioned by this sudden translation had subsided, I look around me to take in the situation. It was delightful beyond anything on earth. And some of the more beautiful sounds and feelings and scenes of the world that I had just left appeared to be reproduced 
in heaven in my new experience. So that he was still having some sounds and feelings in heaven, but in a new way. And still I'm constrained to say that no human eye ever beheld such beauty. No earthly ear ever heard such music. Above me was the blue sky, the loveliest of blue skies. And around me was an atmosphere so balmy that it made my whole physical frame vibrate with pleasure. Do you remember it says, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Shaka baya balabas. Yeah. By the bank of roses on which I found myself reposing. He was on a bank of roses. There flowed the clearest and purest of rivers, which seemed to dance with delight to the memories of its own waters. The trees that grew on its bank were covered with the greenest foliage and laden with the most delicious fruit, sweet to my taste beyond all earthly sweetness. And by lifting my hand, I could pluck and eat the fruit to my heart's delight. In every direction, above and around, the air was not only laden with the richest of odors, yielded by the loveliest of flowers, but also the air was rendered vocal with sweetest sounds and filled with fairest forms. Floating around, around me were beautiful beings. I felt by instinct that they were angels and archangels. Seraphims and cherubims and cherubs. Together with the blood washed and perfected saints who had come from the world below. Sometimes they came near and sometimes they went far. The blue sky appeared at times to be full of white winged, happy, worshipping, joyous beings while the whole country apparently of limitless extent seemed to be filled with a blissful ecstasy that could only be realized by the one experiencing it. My sensations perhaps be imagined. At first I was swallowed up with a sort of rapturous intoxication which was immensely enhanced by the blessed consciousness that I was securely landed in heaven. I had securely landed in heaven. And that I was safe and I would suffer no more. Suddenly <laughs> a set of New feelings began to creep over me. Marvelous as it may appear, I felt somewhat solitary or I felt alone and a little sad even in the midst of this infinitude of felicity. For up to this moment, I was alone. Not one of the happy beings who were soaring and singing in the bright ether above me, all right, had as yet approached me or spoken to me because nobody had spoken to him since he was just smelling things, taking fruits, <laughs> enjoying things. But none of the beings had spoken to him up to then. So, he started to feel lonely in heaven. Hey! Are you still around? Then, he said, I, I was alone in heaven. And then, in a still further and more mysterious way, I felt myself in myself, I felt in myself a sort of unfitness. Like I'm not fit for the society or the fellowship of these P 
your beings who were sailing about me in indescribable loveliness. And yet I thought, how can this be? Have I come here by mistake? Or had I come there uninvited? Was I not counted worthy of being a partaker of this glorious inheritance? I was bewildered. It was indeed a mystery. My thoughts went back to earth. And it was as though an, by an angel's hand, the history of my past life was rolled before my eyes. Hey, what a record it was. At the first glance, I seemed to be able to take in the substance and meaning of my entire earthly career. Becoming at the same time strangely consciousness, conscious of a marvelous quickening of my intellectual powers. Realizing that in a moment, I could take in what would have required me a day to understand in my, when I was on earth, in my poor darkened faculties. With my quickened mind, I saw in this supernatural biography that it contained no record of any of my misdeeds before my conversion. So when the history was played, all the bad things he did before he was converted were they did not appear. The blood of Jesus has washed all your sins away. Huh. The blood. Yeah, sit down. It's, it's not finished, though. I beg you. <laughs> now, this was very gratifying. And I felt like shouting hallelujah over and over again. In fact, in fact, I made some attempts to do so. And, well, I might. Because I was delivered through the mercy of Jesus Christ from the pain of having these things eternally staring at me in the face. In this beautiful holy land where all these holy beings seem to be. Nevertheless, a second glance at my role of my history eh, appalled me. For while the evil things I had done were omitted, it revealed the kind of life required from me by the light I had enjoyed and from the opportunities with which I had been favored. Yea, the, never, the revelation went much deeper. For it described in detail the objects that had influenced me during my earthly career. It set forth the purpose for which my thoughts and feelings and activities had been mainly spent. Like, what was the things I had mainly used my life and my time to do? My money, my influence, and all the other talents which God had entrusted me to use for his glory and for the salvation of men. Every chapter of this role carried back my thoughts to the condition of the world I had left. And while I mused on it, there came up before my eyes such a graphic picture of the world's hatred of God. It's rejection of Christ. It's terrible wickedness with all the wretchedness, destitutions, and abominations flowing out of this state of things. And as this part of the vision passed before my wandering eyes, there came a hurricane of cursing and blasphemy and wild wills of anguish and woe has almost stunned me. I had often seen these things on earth, but I had hidden myself from them. They blinded and stupefied me, for they appeared to indicate a condition a million times blacker, wretched, piteous, than when they had seen on earth. So I felt like putting my hands before my eyes and my fingers in my ears to shut out this hideous apparition out of my sight and hearing. So intensely real and present did they seem. They wrung my soul with such sorrow and self-reproach. 
and the role of memory, which I had just glanced, showed me how I had occupied myself during the few years. I had been allowed to live in the midst of miseries after Jesus Christ had called me to be his soldier and fight for him. You see, your past sins are forgiven. But after you know Jesus Christ and the light which you know, for you to be a part of this church and to hear the things you are hearing, when most of the churches are not preaching about the gospel and the salvation of men, and you know it, and you are hearing it, never think that it will, you will be free for not listening to the responsibility which is on all of us here in Italy. Never think that you are going to go free. No. You, you'll be required. You should have rather been in another church. Even if it would have been, your judgment would have been better if you had been in another church. Because you can claim that your pastors didn't mention anything about being saviors of people. You shouldn't have come to this camp because after saying make yourself a savior of men, you can never go to heaven and just have a walkthrough when they'll say, okay, 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 come. You know, when the Second World War was over, they arrested all the German soldiers and officers and the people who killed people and they tried them in, in, uh, in Nuremberg. And their main defense was that they were following instructions. They were following orders. And if you are a soldier, you are told, do this, do this, kill these people, do this, do this. They were following orders. That was the main defense. And it worked for some of them to get them out. Because in the army and so on, you are following instructions. But they were saying that they should, there are some instructions they shouldn't have followed like that. But it was the main defense. So even one of the guys, the main architect who worked for Hitler for many years, Albert Speer, he was, he, was, he was actually only given something like 20 years in prison. He came out. He served the 20 years and came out of the prison. So, yes, there is some extent to which you can say, I was told to do this and I was told to do this. That's why I did. So, like, if you are not in this church, you know, you, so, oh, we were only told to prosper. Uh, we were only told to prosper. So, you can use it as a defense when you go to heaven. That we were told to prosper. We were told to get money. We were told to make it in life and all that. So you should have rather gone to one of those churches. Uh-huh. You get what I'm saying? Where they only tell you to prosper. But as you've come here, where we are telling you <laughs> to make yourself a savior of men. You get it? You can never use that as an argument when you get to heaven. And say that you didn't know, and it wasn't you, you were not giving such instructions. I hope you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So I don't know whether you want to join another church now, where they will not say such things. Maybe they will only tell you to prosper and to be rich. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> Too late. You, you, you want to stay in the church? Well, now I'm telling you. I'm just telling you. So. Okay. All right, let's continue. Now, I was reminded how instead of fighting his battles and saving souls by bringing them to his feet and so preparing them for admission to this lovely place, I had been intent on earthly things selfishly seeking my own carnal in- interests, worried about my own personal cares and anxieties, and spending my life in practical unbelief, disloyalty, and disobedience to all my most sacred obligations. I must say again, I felt horror-stricken. If, if only at that moment I could have crept out of that land of pure delight, about which I had sung so many songs in the past, in the world I just left, so that I might spend another, spend another lifetime fighting for the Lord. Huh? How gladly I would have done so, but that could not be. 
I was in a fixture. I was in heaven. Heaven must be my abode forever. Hey! hey. Contradictory as it may seem, this thought, the thought that I, I'm, in, I'm in heaven and I cannot come back to earth, filled my soul with unutterable regret. Then another thought, wilder than all my other thoughts I had, came to me. You must not forget, it's a vision. The thought was this. Would it be possible for me to obtain a commission or rather a permission to go back to the world to that very path from where I had come clothed in some form of human form and live my life over again and live it in a manner worthy of my profession, my Christ and my opportunity. Could this be possible? He was wondering if he can get a type of commission. Meanwhile, we already have the great commission and you are, you are in heaven trying to see if you maybe get a commission or a permission. He said the thought that he's going to be in heaven forever disturbed him. Yes. Yeah. The thought that he's here forever, he said it disturbed him. And a wild thought came to him. Can I get from heaven a commission or a permission or be commissioned to go Wow. wow. People are in heaven praying for a commission. Whilst we are here and we have a commission. Hey! Mm. Amazing. Sit down. This is an amazing vision, I tell you. At that moment, if I had been given the answer yes, I would have willingly forfeited all my heavenly blessedness and undergone ages of hardship, ignominy, poverty, and pain. I would have given a million of money. In fact, I would have given the whole world had it been mine to give. But I could see no hope of such a second probation. What was to be done? I had not been thinking about this for many seconds. Eh? When as quick as lightning, one of the bright inhabitants of heaven floated and descended and stood in front of me to my amazement and stood before my astonished gaze. I can never forget the feelings which this thing inspired in me. The, f- the shape and features of this noble form I cannot forget. He was at the same time human and then also angelic. He was earthly and yet celestial. Then I discerned that he was one of the blood-washed multitude who had come out of the great tribulations of the earth. I had, I judged that he was a man. I thought that he's a man, a male. He looked at me and I could not help but look at him. In fact, his eyes compelled me to look at him. And in doing so, I confessed to being ravished with his beauty. I could never imagine a human face looking so divine. And bearing such a grand stamp of dignity and charm. But far beyond the entrancing loveliness was the expression that beamed through the eyes. Those eyes, all right, through which I could see right into the depth. I I appeared as though he could see right into the depths of my soul. I don't know how I appeared to my visitor. I don't know what I looked like. 
<laughs> I knew not what form I was bearing, for I have not yet looked at myself in a mirror since I came. But I had a deep interest for him. An interest that seemed of a saddening nature. I felt sad. For his features appeared to be sorrowful. As I stood there with my eyes fixed on him. He spoke first. Because I could never have someone enough courage to speak to him. His voice was soft and musical. I understood him before I heard his words. You see, when you go to heaven, you can never have a marital quarrel again. You, you understand before the person speaks. You understand what is happening. The voice is like soft and musical. It's fantastic. Huh. Amazing. Now, I, I, I didn't know what language he was speaking, but I could tell it was the universal language of heaven. Yeah. Now, he informed me that my arrival in, in heaven was known throughout a certain district of heaven. Had been, they had been informed. Yes. All those who had died from a certain district where I formerly resided and the tidings of my arrival had been flashed through the heavenly telephone of that particular district and my name had been whispered on every hillside and echoed in every valley and had been breathed from every tree and flower and had been sounded forth at every turn of the golden street and had been articulated in every room of every mansion and proclaimed from every tower and the pinnacle of the stupendous temple. <laughs> one, best, one person who has come to heaven. You see, it's like, it's like a, a Facebook or, or WhatsApp. It's going viral. It went viral in heaven. And all who had known me on earth, who had any knowledge of my family, my opportunities for helping on the kingdom of Christ, whom they worship and adore, were burning to see me, to hear me tell of my victories, which I had won, and then the souls whom I had blessed whilst on earth. And all were especially anxious to hear if I had been the means of bringing salvation to their relatives. That's the, well, the news that had gone. Everybody wanted to know about their people. Yeah. All this was poured into my soul by my visitor and I did not weigh which way to look. Again, I remembered my life of ease and comfort in Italy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey! What could I say? How could I appear with the record of my life before these waiting spirits? What was there in it than a long drawn story of self gratification? I had no matter experiences to recount. I had sacrificed nothing for his dear sake. Worth naming on earth, much less worthy of being published in heaven. As my mind was running in, in, in this direction, when I think my visitor must have discerned what I was speaking, and seeing that he spoke again, he, I could see that he felt some pity. He said, to, he said to me, where you find yourself is not uh, actually heaven. But only one of its four courts. Presently, the Lord himself with the procession of chosen ones will soon come to take you into the city itself where you will reside. If he deems you worthy. That is, if your service on the battlefield below has pleased him. Yes. So he said that where you are is in the forecourt and the Lord himself is going to come to take you in. And he's going to take you in if he feels your 
work on the battlefield below pleases please him. So you see, we are on the battlefield and they are watching us to see whether what we are doing pleases him. Are you listening? Yes. Amazing, isn't it? Yes. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's fantastic. It's supernatural. Okay, sit down. I'm, I'm continuing. Now, meanwhile, the guy said, I have obtained permission to come and speak to you concerning a soul who I understand lives near your late residence. I have obtained permission to come and discuss with you a soul who lives near your late residence. I don't know which souls are living near your current residence. More there are more than 1,000 people that should have been here at this camp. Yes. Italian members who could have been here. I'm telling you, if you were to make yourself a savior of men. I'm telling you. You see, almost everything has an element of deception in it. When you see the church looking large or full, it's very deceptive. You think that, oh, it's okay. But it's not okay. I I am telling you, there are more than 1,000 people who would have been here if you were making yourself a savior Men. Remember Obadiah 21? It says, Saviors shall come on Mount Zion. Saviors, plural. Not the Savior. Saviors. Saviors of men. People who save men. Yeah. No matter your situation. This is the message to all. It's not to some. Every one of us who calls ourselves saved, we are saved for a reason. You would have been dead. There are your friends who are dead already. And for a reason, you are still here. You could have died. All of us could have died a long time. There are, I can mention, I mean, 10 things that would have, can kill you would have killed you earlier. And even some of you have experienced something that could have killed you and you saw this thing can kill me. It didn't kill you. That, that's what we call near death. That's right. But apart from the near death, there are many things that if you provoke me, I can mention you'll be afraid. I don't want you to be afraid. And you see that all these things could kill you all the time. Yes. So if you are alive and if you are here, I'm telling you that there are people whom if you were to minister to would be here. But you see, most of us have left that job to evangelists, uh, pastors, and people we see as serious Christians. But I tell you, that is your job. And that is what's going to change your life. See, what, what people don't realize is that when Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 32, Matthew 6 verse 32, if you don't mind putting Matthew, Matthew 6, 32, he says, all these things do the Gentiles seek. You see, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is not only in the fact that you have said the sinner's prayer. 
but a number of things make you different from an unbeliever. One of them is what you seek. What you seek is one of the differences. You see, there are a number of things that should make you different or peculiar to Christianity. One of them is that you have said the sinner's prayer and given your life to Jesus. But another thing is what you seek. This is, this is where the difference starts. And the Bible says, the, after these things do the Gentiles seek money, prosperity, uh, houses, cars, papers, me. I've never worked for money. Oh yes, I've never, it has never even been an aim. All through my life, I, I mean, it has, even in school, I've just never had that aim. God has saved me from ever having such an aim for my life. To have an aim to be rich, to get money from people, to get money from what I'm doing, from the work, which has never been my aim. So that, that's the mark that differentiates. If God looks straight into your heart, he says, is there a heart of a Christian or a heart of a Gentile or a heart of an unbeliever? That is the thing you see in the heart. You see, you can never know somebody till you know his heart. You can say, I know, I know what you eat. I know you. Somebody, somebody was talking. Said, oh, I see that you like chicken. You, see, you don't know anything about the person. So I see that you like chicken. You like food. You like shrimp. You like. You don't know nothing. You don't know NATO. Who cares about? No, you like chicken. You like this. You know NATO. Until you know somebody's heart, you don't know the person. True. Until you know the heart of a person, you don't know the person. You think you know, but you don't know the person. And God looks straight to your heart. God is not. God is not like this. People who beloved those based on what you look like. Le- looking at hips and thighs. No way. God is far wiser than that. And to be looking at your thighs, your hips, and whatever else, whatever you are holding. No way. Is looking beyond, straight into your heart. Yeah. You know, when I was flying in, today I got to the airport and I put my bag there and I was about to take out my iPad. I said, no, no, don't take out. Don't take anything out. I said, why then the, the lady, I forget it, but she made a joke. She said, no, no, don't, don't, don't take out any, nothing, nothing. I said, why? She laughed. She said, oh, new machine. We have new machines. You don't have to take anything out. Yeah. Yeah. No nothing. Don't take no NATO out. Because we are trying to get nearer to like how God can see all the way through. Yeah. See how God, God, God sees all the way. God doesn't, God doesn't need you to take off your shirt or to see whether you eat chicken. or no, no, he's, looking, he's looking straight to your heart. to take no needle out. You can see right through. You see through. And this is the distinction between Christians and non-Christians. Straight out your heart. Not what I eat chicken. Christians eat chicken. Non-Christians eat chicken. That's not what, that's not what can do. That's not what can do, 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 distinguish you. Christians who sleep. Christians, non-Christians who also sleep. The distinction is right there in the heart. All right. Okay, sit down. Now, is the room hot or I'm imagining it? Is there something we are doing wrong? Can we open a window? Can we cool it down?
Okay. Now, Christians feel hot, non Christians feel hot. Yeah. That, that, is, that, is not, that is not where you see the difference. Yes. You see the difference in the hearts of the people. Yeah. It's one of the clear marks of difference. Amen? Amen. Are you here or you are leaving? Yeah. Now, back to the guy. He's now talking to the guy who's come to see him in heaven. Now, he says, the Lord is going to come and he'll take you if he feels that your service on the battlefield below has pleased him. Meanwhile, I am here to have obtained permission to speak to you concerning a soul whom I understand lives near your late residence. And in whom I feel a deep interest. Then the guy continues. He says, our knowledge of the transactions of earth is for our own sakes very limited. Now and then we are permitted to get a glimpse of what is passing there. Then he spoke to him. He says, can you? Looking at me with an unspeakable longing. Tell me anything about my son. He was my only son. I loved him dearly. In fact, I loved him too much. I spoiled him when he was a child. He had his own way. He grew up willful, passionate, and disobedient. My example did not help him. Then he said, I am myself. Through the instrumentality of the Salvation Army. Was rescued from a life of sin and shame. Washed. Regenerated and taught to fight for souls. And I had the privilege of winning many. To the bloodstained banner of the cross. But an accident. However suddenly overtook me at my employment. And as suddenly swung me into heaven. The guy was explaining how he came to heaven. To the guy that he he was saved, but he had an accident at work. And he was moving to heaven to his surprise. Then he continued, where is my boy? Oh, give me some tidings of my boy. He lived near you. I believe. He had business dealings with you. Is he saved? What did you do for him? Is there any hope? Tell me what his feelings to my Lord were when you last spoke to him. He ceased speaking and my heart sank within me. What could I say? I knew the boy. The story of him, the father's death and his prodigal son had been told me and yet I had never addressed one serious word to the young man about his soul or about his savior. I had been busy with other things. And now what could I say to his father as he stood there before me I was dumb. The cloud I had noticed before gathered again on, my, on the face of my visitor. Only with a darker shadow this time. He must have guessed. He looked at me with a glance that expressed the disappointment to himself and the pity he felt for me. Then he turned from me. And suddenly spreading forth his white wings, he soared away out of my sight. I was so intensely, intently gazing on the receding form of my visitor that I failed to notice a second guy had occupied his place. I turned and looked on the newcomer. It was a spirit of the same order. There was the same dignity, the same marvelous expression of inward power and purity. But in his case, these graces were combined with a beauty of a more delicate and enthralling mold. Divinely fair as I thought my first visitor, more beautiful than any conception or dream of earth could be. Yet there was a beauty that surpassed it. My former visitor looked like a man, but this one was a woman. I had once on earth wished I could look upon Eve in the hour when she was young and pure and beautiful and when she came from the hands of her maker and I'd imagined something like how her lovely figure would have been on that bridal morning. (laughs) 
<laughs> now here as I saw Eve reproduced before my eyes, clothed in immortal youth, as pure, as beautiful, nay, more so than her first mother could have been. Was this not the divine master's finished workmanship? Anyway, as soon as I was wakened from my thoughts by the voice of this fair creature, who from her manner evidently wished to speak to me about something. She introduced herself somewhat after the fashion of my previous interrogator. And she too had come from the very same neighborhood where I had lived so long. She told me her name. I had heard it before. She was a widow who had struggled with great difficulties. Her husband's death had been her life. Converted at his grave, she had given herself up unreservedly to fight for the Lord. Her children had been her first care and they had all been converted and entered into the battlefield except one. That unsaved one was a girl who had been her mother's delight. She had grown up lovely in form, the village pride, but alas, she had gone astray. It was the old story of seduction and cruel abandonment. The mention of that name brought another sadness over her lovely face. I listened to the story as it came from this mother's heart. I had heard something of this painful incident when on earth. But I turned my ear from it as being of no concern of mine. Little did I think it would, I would ever be confronted with it in heaven. You see, there are things you cannot believe you will be confronted with in heaven. Hey! hey! People you sat by, you never spoke to them. People when you open your door, here is another door to somebody's flat. And you never knock and say, Jesus loves you. I want to talk to you about Jesus. People you have condemned as you see them, you are saying, you, I am bad, but you are badder. As I have scarcely made it into heaven, you dear, you can never come. Because you, you dear, Charlie, Charlie, you are, you are bad, like bad dear, you are bad. Like I'm bad, but you are the baddest. How, how many have felt some people are badder than you? Now, how many have felt that it's like you are lucky to be saved, but that guy, I don't think he can make it. But I tell you, there is no one who cannot be saved. Jesus can save them. Amen. And you know, being in the first love church and hearing the young people give their testimonies every week of salvation, it, it gives me such faith in the power of salvation and changing lives. The power of a great change through the Holy Ghost and through people persistently talking. I realize that you know, that conversion takes sometimes like a repeated yeah. effort. Yeah. And the same person who looks very hard softens and softens and softens. And then the permanent change comes about. Yes. You know, one day I, a, a pastor told me that uh, a certain man from a certain country who names, whose name begins with a certain alphabet <laughs> yes. came to his office and this man had been in a war and had killed people a lot of people and he said that when the man was describing the things he had done he wanted the man to get out of his office yes and actually, me too, when I met this same fellow, and he was telling me what he was doing, I was thinking that the blood of Jesus is being misused. <laughs> yes. The, the blood of Jesus is being misused. <laughs> yeah. Like, the badness is too much and it, it's a misuse of the blood of Jesus for this person to be saved. But he was saying how he was saved. 
Yes, he was saying how he was saved and all the things he had done. He was sitting here, I'm sitting here, and he stopped. I said, Hey, are you a real human being? So I don't want you to think that the blood of Jesus is being misused. It cannot be misused. That hardened, hardcore sinner. Don't look at him when you are talking. You know, one day I went to, I was going to visit somebody and I just felt in my heart, speak the word. So I memorized the whole of Lazarus and the rich man's story because the way the man was, I knew that I could not open a Bible. <laughs> but I have to quote. So I memorized the whole thing and I revised. You see, so when I sat by him in, on his expensive cushions, in his expensive beautiful mansion. I just quoted. I said there was a certain rich man just like you. Hey! <laughs> he was clothed in purple and fine linen. Just like you. And he died and he went to hell. Yeah, I quoted the whole thing. Yes. And I, and I, I gave it to him. Because that was my duty. Yes. He remembers me after today. Yeah. Always. Hmm. Now, this lady looked at me and said, my daughter lived near you. You know her. What have you done for her? Have you saved my child? I'm reading, have you saved my child? Make yourself a savior of men. Have you saved my child? <laughs> at this, I cried out in agony. I put my hand before my eyes. I could no longer look at her. How she continued to look on me with her powerful, piercing, pitying eyes, I know not. But when I withdrew my hand, she was gone. Then I, I, again, I gasped out. Oh my God, is this heaven? Will these interrogations go on forever? Will the meanness and selfishness of my past life, with all their sad consequences, from which I had hoped forever to have gotten away in this country, haunt me every day and every hour through eternity? What shall I do? Can I not go back to earth and do something to redeem myself from this wretched sense of unworthiness, would it be possible for me to live my life over again? This question had hardly passed through my mind when another person alighted in front of me, resembling the first man. His introduction was the same, but his story was different. He had been a great sinner and had been awakened and won to Christ by the salvation army a short back, time back and had joined. Much forgiven, he had loved much. All his desire when on earth was to get free from the entanglements of business. He was just trying to get free from the entanglements of business and devote himself as a salvation army officer to the work of saving men. He was trying to disconnect himself from his businesses and his business engagements. When he was just about to realize his wish, he had been sent for from heaven. When he was just about to finish disentangling himself from his business, they sent for him. He said, ah, we need you. And he was a spirit of glory and joy coming to inquire from me concerning his other companions. He said, did you know my old, you know, workers, co-workers in the Salvation Army? Their hall was close to my house of business. And he asked me, have I done anything for his old mates who were drinking and cursing and fighting their way to hell? He had died with prayers for them on his lips. Had I done nothing, anything to stop them on their way to ruin? To all the searching appeal, what could I say? I knew them, but I had never given them a word of encouragement. I knew the hovels in which his old mates lived and the drinking saloons in which they spent their money. But I had been too busy or too proud or too shamefaced to seek them out with the tidings of the Savior's love. Again, I was speechless. He guessed my feelings and left in sadness. Ah, for myself, I was in anguish. Strange as it may appear. Considering I was in heaven, 
I'm sad, but I'm in heaven. It was so that whilst I was standing there, there was no comfort for me that I saw a marvelous phenomenon on the distant horizon. All that part of heaven seemed to be filled with a bright, brilliant light. Here was a brilliance far surpassing anything that can be imagined. And I was looking with indescribable delight and wondered what it meant. So I'll move a little closer. Now I could hear the sound of music. The sound came nearer. The music was beyond such music I'd ever heard before. Gradually, the rapturous hosts drew near. And rapidly, I might have said, all right, at length, I was able to comprehend the marvelous sight that approached me. Who could describe it? The whole firmament was filled with an innumerable, with innumerable forms of beauty and dignity. Here, evidently, was a representative portion of the aristocracy of heaven accompanying its king. There was a host coming with the king. You will see the king. Here, evidently, was a representative portion of the aristocracy of heaven representing its king. Wow. wow. And uh, who, as my first visitor had informed me, was coming to welcome me into the heaven of heavens. Those who had fought a good fight and who had kept their faith. I stood transfixed in with awe and wonder. Was I actually going to see my Lord and be welcomed by him? In the thought of this rapture, I forgot the sorrow that only a moment before had been in my heart. Now the procession was upon me. Hey. As the procession came and it neared me, I fell prostrate, prostrate before it. What wonderful beings these heavenly spirits appeared. Each one looked in himself to my poor untutored eyes like a god. Huh? Everybody looked like a god. Rank after rank passed by me. Each spirit turning his eye upon me or seeming to do so. And to everyone, I could not help feeling that I was an object of pity. Mercy. I was a what? An object. Ah, perhaps it was my own feelings that made me imagine this. But it certainly appeared to me as though these noble beings regarded me as a cowardly soul who had only cared for my own interest on earth and had only been induced to come up there from similar selfish motives. Thousands passed by me. All these mighty hosts were praising God, either in hymns or expressive of adoration in worship. Wow. wow. Now, the procession halted, and at the word of command, an instant formed up in three sides of a square in front of me, and the king was standing in the center immediately pointed to the spot where I had prostrated myself. He was lying there. The king pointed. Mercy. Hey, are you ready to meet Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> what a sight that was. It was worth toiling and each gazing upon him. All right? And I beheld the celestial form of the God-man. Who once died for me upon the cross. Yes. He says I beheld the celestial form of the God man. Who once died for me on the cross. That's Jesus. What a sight that was. Hallelujah. Amen. Next. To these. Were these. Uh -huh, nearest to the king were the patriarchs and apostles of ancient times. Patriarchs and apostles. Do you know who are patriarchs and apostles? Huh? Yeah. Mercy. Next to these, rank after rank, holy martyrs who had died for him. 
Then followed the army of warriors who fought for him in every part of the world. Around, about, above, below, there were myriads of spirits redeemed from the earth who, although never heard of outside their neighborhood or beyond their time, had with self-denying zeal and untiring toil labored to extend God's kingdom and to save the souls of men. Encircling the, go- the gorgeous scene was an innumerable host of angelic beings who had kept their first estate. Proud it seemed to be to me to minister to the happiness and exaltation of the soldier saints who had faithfully lived for their Lord in the poor world from whence I came. I was bewildered by the spectacle. All at once, I, however, recollected myself and bethought of me of the high presence before whom I was bowed. It was not pain, yet it was not pleasure. It was not anger. It was not approval. All right? I felt that in that countenance, so transcendentally admirable and glorious, there was yet no welcome for me. Huh? Are you ready to go to heaven and they'll say, there's no welcome for you here? Now listen, it's almost, we're almost at the end of it. Listen to this end part. He said, now this Jesus spoke to him. He said, you will find little in yourself in harmony with these ones. There's little to compare you with these people who are all around you. Yeah. You are not like them. Mercy. These are now partakers of my glory who counted not their lives dear unto them that they might bring honor to me and salvation to men. And as he spoke, he waved his hand and gave a look of loving admiration of the hosts of apostles and, and martyrs that were gathered and warriors that were gathered around him. Oh, that look of Jesus. I felt it to be worth dying a hundred deaths or being torn asunder by wild beasts to gain one such loving recognition. The angel escort felt it too. Then the king turned his eyes on me. Oh, I wish that some mountain would fall on me and hide me forever from his presence. But I wished in vain. Some invisible and irresistible force compelled me to look up and his eyes met, my eyes met his eyes. Kaba shakaya. Then he said, they said, I felt rather than heard, I felt him say to me, are you listening to this part? This is the, this is the, I'm, I'm reading the last sentence and then that's the end of this vision. And that, that's what I want you to hear. He says, he spoke to me. He said, I felt him say to me. Hmm? In words that themselves in living fire upon my excited brain. He said, go back to earth. You shall have another opportunity and listen, I'm reading the last sentence. And if you prove yourself worthy of my name and show to the world that you possess my spirit, listen to this, by doing my work and making yourself a savior of men, you shall return hither and I will give you a place in my conquering train and a share in my everlasting glory. Where this theme is from is from William Booth. 
make yourself a savior of men. Yes. Making yourself a savior of men. Yes. I'm giving you a second chance. And that was the end of his vision. Yes. And that's the same thing I came to share with you. Yes. You don't need to die and be asking for permission or a commission. I, 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 was, I was shocked by that part. He was asking if he can be given a commission. Hey. When the commission is there. Is it not amazing? amazing. We want to be given a commission. When there is already a commission. And he said, if you prove yourself by going back to the earth and doing my work, two things, doing my work and making yourself a savior of men. There can be 1,000 people from Italy. I don't mean Germany. I don't mean Spain. I don't mean anywhere. I say Italy. 1,000 people here. Saved by your work. I'm giving you, I came to give you employment. This one, you don't need any paper or any card to do this work. This is the work. Yes. Make yourself a savior of men. Yes. Make yourself a savior of men. Yeah. Because through you, I tell you, not me, you. You. Yes. You go and save men. There are people who are waiting for somebody to talk to them. But nobody talks to them. So the news talks to them. Christian Amman Paul talks to them. CNN talks to them. Oprah Winfrey talks to them. Larry King talks to them. All the news people talk to them. But you never talk to them. Amen. Amen. And that is God's wish for us. You see, I, I always used to see Jesus as the Savior. But I realized that through what you do, you are like a Savior. If you, if you, if you help people to be saved, it's like you are, you are actually like a type of Savior. Yeah. Yeah. You give them life. You, you actually change them. You rescue them. You take them out of darkness. You bring them to God. Savior of men. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Lift your hand and ask God to make you a Savior of men.